Our guests this week are Ganeshri Wood and Eva Dorr. They both work on the Syrian issue for the Next Century Foundation, and we will be talking about Syria. Welcome to the English Hour on ANN Satellite Television. It's an interesting topic this week because we'll be talking about something close to all of our hearts, the issue of Syria. Our guests this week are Ganeshri Wood, who is Chief Research Officer at the Next Century Foundation, and Eva Doer, who is our junior fellow looking at the refugee issue. Eva's just come back from the Syrian border. Um, we'll be discussing the whole problem of the refugees, the crisis that is faced by these poor people who are being dispossessed of their homes. We'll also be talking about the international community's response to the Syria crisis and the key issue of ISIS and the, the volunteers who are going to, to fight with ISIS or Daesh as it's known in the Arab world. So three very critical issues to discuss today, all in regard to Syria. The Syrian civil war is entering its fifth year. The humanitarian situation in the country is atrocious and unlikely to improve as war and violence are ongoing with little hope of a resolution in the short term. Official figures suggest conservatively that over 10 million people have been forced out of their homes, with 6.5 million internally displaced persons, IDPs, within Syria, and some 3 million who fled the country and who are now living as refugees in foreign countries. The actual total may be higher. Both Western countries and Syria's neighbors are struggling with their response to the refugee crisis. Many of those affected and under threat in Syria, face the hardships and dangers of walking to the country's border in the hope of seeking asylum. However, the sheer numbers of refugees places a burden on the neighboring country's social, political, and economic systems, causing tension and ultimately leading governments to close their borders. Lebanon closed its borders in October 2014, a decision which caused outcry. With fewer new refugees seeking refuge in Lebanon, Turkey has become the country taking the largest number of Syrian refugees at this time. Around 5,000 foreign fighters from the West have joined ISIS and embraced their struggle, motivated perhaps in part by a rejection of Western secularism. The UK government's response has been to embrace the idea that mass surveillance will cure the problem by identifying all those prone to adopt extremism. However, surveillance is at best only half the answer and leaves little room for reflection on the broader causes of the problem, which may lie in the West itself rather than in the Middle East. The UN has this UN speaker, it's understandable, but they refer to people, refugees within the country as IDPs, internally displaced persons. Um, of course, everybody forced to leave their home and flee is, is a refugee of some sort. So it's, it's a kind of um, bizarre shorthand where the UN is only describing those who have fled across borders as refugees. But there are, as you, as you rightly say, at least... 10 million, but possibly considerably more yes, people who I'm have sorry. been displaced from their homes, um, which is tragic. Uh, Eva, you I mean, just coming to this issue, this key issue of refugees, you've just come back from the Turkish border and you were looking at conditions there. How, how, what was, what were your impressions? Um, it's really hard to uh, summarize what I've seen. I think in general, just um, briefly going back to the figures, it's only an estimate and it only gives us sort of an, of an idea of what 
scale of a humanitarian crisis we're dealing with. And a lot of times these figures are there in order to, to attract media attention, which is crucially important for humanitarian mm. actors because this is all donated mm. often by countries. So all these operational terminologies are very much just in, in a humanitarian sense used for shortcuts in order to be able to actually do anything. Mm. But on the ground, I think everyone is well aware of that these might be underestimate figures and still humanitarian actors are very good at, or I believe at least try to do as much as possible to look at everyone who's in need within the country. And I think it's really important to, to understand there are a lot of um, international organizations which work within Turkey because now the security situation within Syria has deteriorated to such an extent and is so difficult that very few Western staff members can actually go into Syria and work and mm. operate there. Mm. So a lot of times what international organizations do is work together with um, implementing partners, which are essentially local organizations, Syrian organizations or Turkish organizations who, who manage a lot of the in-country distributions. Right. So along the Syrian border um, or the Turkish Syrian border, there are around 100 local organizations and they have a lot of capacity as well mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. resources. So. And so coming back to this, so that sets the scene, but coming back to this question, in terms of what you saw, uh, conditions in, mm. in the camps for, starting with the camps inside Turkey themselves, I mean, those, they vary considerably. I, I, as I understand it, there's some camps uh, conditions are reasonably good, other camps they are pretty poor. Would that be fair? Um, it's more coordinating or aid is more coordinated out of certain hubs. So you meet other organizations and they tell you and they give you impressions of how the conditions mm. are. But I've personally not been to a camp. But we, we were hearing tales of um, mm. problems, for example, with the winter, um, mm. I mean, uh, during the winter, uh, the tents, the, the large tents that were coming in, for example, from Saudi Arabia, mm. people were actually grateful for them initially, but as the weather got colder, they were too thin and too big. Mm. And mm, it's yeah, I, I believe it's a bit of um, an issue here now that the Syrian conflict has been going on for so long that a lot of the equipment that initially was or went into camps has now either <laughs> lost its uh, lost, lost its function because it's been mm. set up for for a few years now and they need to be replaced. And then in the winter, it's really difficult because it's a lot colder than in a lot of countries where uh, these, this equipment has maybe originally come from. And now it needs to be replaced by heavier right. tents or other you were, equipment. You were in that part of Turkey down by the Syrian border, mm. uh, which is... Which is Hatay, Antakya. Antakya. Yeah. So. yeah. And, and that's, that's largely... Uh, that's what it's in uh, largely. I mean, in in Turkey itself, it's largely Alawite and Christian, or what? Yeah, it's a, a lot of Alawites live mm. in that mm. area. So it has always been a very multicultural area. But you had a lot of Arabs, a lot of Christians, and a lot of Turks living together. And um, the population, in comparison to the rest of Turkey, is very much Shiite, Alawite. Okay. So um, yeah, and that makes that's very interesting in terms of humanitarian protection or um, help as well because and that's like I believe the whole problem of Syria as well it's so politicized and as Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan and Iraq all neighboring countries um, who obviously take take on most of the mm. refugees they are all somehow politically integrated into the conflict or they at least have some sort oh, of, of idea about the conflict yeah. and that really um, poses new challenges to the situation because the I mean for a start there's the whole issue of the local population I mean the mm. local population in Antakya or Hatay as the mm. I presume the Turks call it Hatay yeah. but the, um, that area would regard themselves as Syrian and they would regard that or at least certain Arab, it, yeah. it's a part of historically it's many of the Syrians would regard mm. that area as part of Syria so they're 
loyalties uh, and being Alawite, their loyalties would be tend to be a little more to the Syrian government than to yeah than yeah. I believe that's true. Right. So the, there are all sorts of tensions there because obviously you have uh, how how are they? Uh, what is the what is the feeling of the local population about refugees coming in? It must be mm. cause stresses. Yeah, it's really difficult, and I think it's a really important thing to understand. Um, the more I mean, refugees from Syria are mostly Sunni, and they come into these countries. And if you have large Alawite populations, they tell you, and it's a very given fact that like everyone wants to support them, and everyone is. Um, very much or agrees with the general idea that there's an international need of mm. protection and help to support them. But we cannot forget that these numbers, like we're talking about 1.6 million refugees in Turkey, or in Lebanon it's even more staggering because the mm. country or the population is much smaller. Mm. And if all of a sudden every fourth person of the population is then a Syrian refugee, and thereby Sunni and what comes with it, that really um, puts quite a lot of burden in terms of the economic situation, but also the political situation on these host countries. Yes. So even... And, and social pressures, I imagine. Yeah, yes. very, very much so. And that doesn't mean everyone's very welcoming or used to be also very welcoming. Mm. But now, as the conflict goes on, um, the social situations really play out and the social problems and consequences that comes with this. Mm. So, yeah, I think there's a lot to reflect on that yet and mm. how difficult that is. Because it's very easy. When, when Lebanon closed its borders, I believe in October of last year, there was a huge outcry and people said, how can they do that? There's really, they've signed you know, all the, mm -mm. All the mm. documents that said that they mm. had to assist and that's all very well said. But when you're actually in this country, you have to, or one has to realize that these governments also have a yeah. populace that they need to look after. Yeah, and it's not all about foreign politics and international <laughs> politics all the time, but it's often about domestic politics. And yeah, social tensions are definitely rising. Yeah. Come back to Sri. I mean, mm -hmm. the the international community has pledged huge amounts in aid, but yeah. much of it has not been. I mean, much of it has been. Some countries better than others, to, to be fair. But um, and Britain has not been too bad in terms of committing it or fulfilling its commitment. But many nations um, have made vast pledges that they have given very little of. So there is a problem, isn't there, in terms of the actual level of aid getting through. It's, uh, there isn't enough, I think this is a... Mm, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, lots of countries are very, you know, very courageous. They have just pledged huge amounts, but at the end of the day, the actual transfer of the money takes time. Mm. There's a lot of bureaucratic red tape to get through, and by the time it trickles down, these various organizations, and by the time it gets to the actual people, it's a very small percentage that finally mm. gets there, and there's always sort of delays. And countries like the UK, what they tend to do is they tend to throw money at the problem instead of actually resettling any refugees. I mean, Britain's only mm. offered to resettle 90 Syrian refugees, mm. compared to Germany, who has settled about 30,000. Right. And indeed Sweden, who has virtually opened its borders Absolutely. to as many Sweden. as would Even like Spain, to Spain, Denmark, but yeah. there were still tiny amounts, about 140, 130 places. And yet that can't be the answer. If you, looked, if you want to deal with a cat catastrophe on this scale, just to, I mean, just to resettle refugees, you are then, you could argue that you're part of the problem. You are in effect uh, helping the ethnic cleansing of areas because people are, um, will never mm -hmm. go back. I mean, they, whatever people say, once you resettle, they are never, history tells us that people rarely go back once they're permanently resettled. Um, but just coming back to that point of the actual aid, uh, because you were there looking at humanitarian actors, Eva, uh, and dealing with the, uh, the, seeing the situation as far as these, these people who are having to, to help. Um, 
there is not enough is this correct i mean there is not enough uh, there are not enough resources not enough funding mm. um, i mean is that fair to say you you there is a shortage in mm. your experience of it's very difficult to say there is um there are a lot of resources there sure could be more but it's not only about and i think that's fair to say it's not only about equipment but it's about how this is managed and it needs a lot of resources in terms of even knowledge gathering about what we are doing because as you said it's not as easy you can't just resettle people there's a lot behind this and there's mm. a lot of consequences to you that need to be taken into consideration and in general yeah i do believe there um, is more need but i also believe that there's a lot of um we, or a lot of resources has have already gone into you. Interesting. It. Now, in in terms of where Eva was on the mm -hmm. on the on the Turkish border, Shri, mm. you were, you have a whole number, a whole range of because you have up by Kamishli, you have the Kurds, mm -hmm. don't you? With the, uh, I guess largely PYD, or we, what we call PYD, PYD um, militia or groups in control. Um, and then as you move across, you've got ISIS, um, mm -hmm. certainly in, in, in various areas, um, or Daesh. Then you've got Jabhat al-Nusra, and then you've got uh, certain elements or, or of the, what we know as the, the, the Free Syrian, for instance, there's the Idlib Military Council, which would yeah. be kind of Free Syrian Army. So the, you you have an area there up by the Turkish border that is, uh, and, and, and elements of the, presumably still elements, the areas that are still have remnant of the Syrian government control. Mm. I'm not sure no. uh, to what degree that's the case. So you have, you have a real mix of actors across there. Um, the, that's true to say? I mean, that, that's where, where it's at? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's always constantly ever changing. Mm. I mean, and it's also hard to keep track of because there's so little people on the ground to report back. Right. So, but I think it's fair enough to say it's sort of along those lines. But it's constantly ever changing. I mean, fractions are always constantly splitting up into even right. smaller factions. I mean, once there was one point, uh, Jabhat al Nusra and ISIS were absolute enemies, and then somewhere along the lines. They had pledged allegiance, and then they had split again, and now Jabal Nusra is against ISIS. It's, it is a bit of a mess, but it's ever constantly changing, so it's really hard to say. It's mm. Looking from outside in, it's really hard to judge what is really happening. And, and sh so they have, I mean, currently it seems that Nusra, the Nusra and ISIS are the two major players, aren't they, in terms of... At the moment, yeah. yeah. I mean, there still is the Aleppo Military Council. There are still elements of the old Free Syrian Army, but the the big bullies in 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 terms of you know the characters that are that are swaggering around and really have a lot of weight are Nusra and ISIS. Absolutely, definitely. Uh, FSA have seemed to sort of taken a back like a, a back step. They're sort of like. It gradually faded out. Well, it, it seems to give the impression they've sort of faded out a little bit, and it's really come down to these two heavyweights, mm -hmm. who are now sort of, well, with the Kurds as well, the Peshmerga oh, as yes, well. Oh yes, of course, between no, these uh, three, absolutely, it's, yes. It's, it's between these three, yeah. really, it's really come down yeah. to this final three. But in a way, the Kurds have been pretty much out of the fight against the Syrian government. The, absolutely. Uh, they they have a tendency to stand aside from that. They've got their own problems with Daesh absolutely. and. Um, and it is a Daesh Kurdish fight that we've we've tended to see. We haven't seen um, Jabhat al Nusra fighting the Kurds, or is that? I think there are small. It is happening, but it's not as big. Or mm. maybe it all comes down to the media. The media obviously cherry picks what it wants to broadcast. And at the moment, the spotlight is on the Kurds and ISIS. Mm. I'm very sure there are fights between Jabhat al Nusra and ISIS, but they're probably not as on a larger scale, right. like what's happening in Kobani, mm -hmm. for example. Now, when, oh, poor Kobani, you saw the, mm. I mean, the liberation of Kobani, at what cost? Um, More that, of the destruction of Kobani than yeah, liberation. Yes, yes, it was awful. I, I, I don't know, but the, obviously we have a 
fight that's necessary to to get rid of ISIS, but it does seem that we really have to think carefully about what we're doing. But having said that, um, there is a difference in terms of humanitarian work, mm. um, or at least your experience dealing with these agencies in, in, in that area of Turkey. When um, people can work with whatever we think of Jabal Nusra, and it is uh, mm. not exactly flavor of the month, mm. nonetheless, <laughs> People can, uh, humanitarian ag work agencies can go into areas controlled by Jebel al-Nusra. They cannot go into areas controlled by ISIS. Is that basically mm. true? Or? Yeah, I think especially after the international coalition has basically gathered and mm -hmm. mobilized their fight against ISIS, it's very, it's very difficult because these countries are also donor countries for humanitarian aid. So as soon as um, there's ISIS in control, you would never find donors who would give money for you to put it into areas that are controlled by ISIS. Also, it's immensely difficult to do so and, and quite dangerous, dangerous just, for the refugees. I mean... Well, dangerous also for the aid workers because we've seen oh, so yeah. many mm, taken. Yeah. Some of those, those lovely people, people yeah. I mean, some, some really lovely people have been taken and killed. But, um, uh, yeah. Peter Kessig comes to mind. I just can't... I mean... Um, a, a wonderful man who, who really was killed mm. so brutally. But anyway, sorry, if yeah. you were about to say. No, but I, I believe what's maybe also, or perhaps more staggering, is if you, you have to be really careful because if you, if you give aid in whatever form, especially mm. in big tents or larger, or you mm. set up larger camps, that exposes people to being refugees. Mm. And as refugees within Syria and within the conflicting parties have a very strong identity themselves that can lead to them becoming a target from the outside. So it's really, really difficult to... You mean a target in, in what sense? A target for ISIS? Or for ISIS or for yes. other conflicting parties. And I believe that actually the ISIS-Kurdish dualism is more um, more crucial in the northwest of the country, uh, in of the course. northeast yes, of the well, country. Yes, yes. But then, as soon as you go further west, yeah. there's a lot of meddling going on between pro Assad militias, mm -hmm. um, then opposition groups. And Jabhat al Nusra is one of them, which is very prominent. But actually, the area they control is fairly small nowadays. So it's actually not. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily, or I don't necessarily believe that. The, that to differentiate it between ISIS and Al Nusra um, is very helpful in terms of how we how so we view we, the conflict. So we should view them as one. Not really. not necessarily as one because they don't associate themselves mm -hmm. with each other. But I don't think that there's a massive um, difference. Yeah, and massive idea in Jabhat Al Nusra that they want to that they want to fight ISIS or anything like this. Mm -hmm. It's it's really still on these grounds. Uh, a civil war in terms of that okay. Assad is fighting. Let's talk about this second role. Everybody, everybody's quite aware that that um, you have different parties backing different sides, uh, and, and obviously Iran is very supportive, as is Russia, of the Syrian government, and others are uh, supportive of elements of the opposition. But let's just talk about the the peace process such as it is we've seen we've seen russia take a lead in initial stages it was briefly britain then america took the real lead um, then russia took over in the lead then and uh, the united nations has been engaged yes they have been um, the uh, we've seen a series of um, geneva one geneva two moscow one uh, now there are rumors, of, uh, I mean, uh, other talks going uh, ongoing and, and developing, and, yeah. and certainly Scandinavia has been oh, taking yes. a role. There's always rumors of uh, Oslo too. Uh, but the interesting thing is the opposition actually has been to Oslo last year twice mm -hmm. uh, to have talks amongst themselves under the observation of the Norwegian Department of Foreign Affairs. Really? So this is something that has happened, but hasn't really been reported widely. So it's a bit of a surprise. This is something that has already happened. So if they are thinking of having 
a post Moscow one, Oslo two. It might actually it's looking like a possibility, but of course the specifics are all hazy. But the United Nations has nations have stepped up now. Uh, very recently, they said that um, um, the new Brahimi Stefan de Mistura said that he is going to start renegotiating with the Syrian government, basically to restart the whole political process with a clear political horizon. Now, the Stefan de Mistura came out initially with this idea that we could somehow, I mean, the, the ground just keeps shifting, but his initial response to this whole crisis when he took over was that he, he was going to um, try and promote a kind of hudna, a kind of freeze. Yes. That's but he's still pushing for it, especially in, uh, around Aleppo. Right. So he's sending his mm. deputy, uh, Ramzi Azaldine, I think. Mm. Ramzi Azaldine, Ramzi, interesting, uh, Egyptian. He's sending his deputy to go and talk to the Syrian government to see if they can sort of broker some sort of ceasefire to just reduce the violence and try and somehow break this deadlock and start bringing about some kind of peace in a, process. In, in a way, this is happening anyway. These, the, at a local level, we are seeing uh, a kind of um, a stagnation of the fighting, and then there are, there are specific areas. There are certain Damascus suburbs where there's fighting. There are certain areas where Jebat Nusra is fighting the Kurds or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the, in many respects, the, the, the maelstrom of fighting that was taking place is, has, has subsided. So you have almost local truces, don't you, uh, to, mm. to a degree? Absolutely, because there are lots of reports now coming back, uh, coming out of the country where like parts of Damascus is almost back to normal. It's like almost like a different planet. They say uh, markets are open, shops mm. are open, people are working. It's almost back to normal. But these are just small pockets that mm. we see. Mm. But of course, when you look at the wider picture, the country is just falling to pieces. Yes. Uh, I mean, the Moscow talk ended on the 29th of January with mm. no actual development, mm. despite the setback. Now, the Russians now are promoting a new idea, almost over the head of Stefan de Mistura, which mm. is this idea, uh, well, it's a new idea, but it's an old idea. It's the old Brahimi idea of a uh, power-sharing government. Absolutely. That's what they are pushing, the, uh, the Russian deputy foreign minister, mm -hmm. Mikhail Bogdanov, he was sort of almost boasting that, yes, if there's anyone who can provide a solution to this, it's going to be Moscow, because we uh, have invited all the oppositions from across the factions, including the Muslim Brotherhood, and also the Syrian government. So we're looking at everyone, we're inviting mm. everyone. Now, I'm never, not sure how everyone this is. I know. I mean, they're, they're, it's very selective. Uh, you, yeah. when, the, when, the, when the West said they were inviting everyone, it tended to be the Islamist factions. When the Russians, it, again, is picky, they, they're very cautious. They're m many factions um, are not included when... Well, the main uh, like insurgent groups have not been invited at all. Obviously. And yeah. uh, most of the opposition, in fact, have shunned the event because Russia is such a staunch backer of Assad. They refuse to have anything to do with it. So how he is sort of mm. claiming that they are going to be the ones who are going to provide, negotiate the solution... I have no idea. And yet there is a sense in which, um, um, and I, I, I don't know, I, I'm looking back at other conflicts. Um, I mean, you look at, for instance, you, you know Palestine. Um, Hamas is not in the negotiations at mm. the table. Um, it's, it's the fatter um, president and, and so on that negotiates peace on behalf of the Palestinian Authority, even though the Palestinian Authority returned a parliament that was predominantly Hamas. Hamas doesn't. It, it, Hamas is not even part of the. Uh, uh, well, it isn't part of the of the yeah, mm. Palestine, What do they call it? The um, Palestinian Authority. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, no, but it's part of the Palestinian Authority in theory, but in practice, when it comes down to it, um, it's it's frozen out, mm. and yet negotiations can take place in a way. In, in a sense, the Syrian conflict is a similar situation. You don't necessarily, as long as somebody's negotiating, hmm. it doesn't, their legitimacy is not necessarily the issue. Is that hmm. fair to say? Yeah, I, I believe it's very true. It's very necessary, especially in 
this entire muddling where it's very easy to lose certain factions by mm -hmm. claiming that they're only terrorist groups and you're not able mm -hmm. or you're not allowed to negotiate with terrorist groups because what we allegedly call terrorist groups often represent a large faction of um, of the mm. people because a lot of money sits behind terrorist groups. So they can serve the people very well in terms of infrastructure and domestic issues that need to be sorted out. So I, I also believe that it's very important to open up the negotiating table to basically everyone who would like to be part of the solution, at least to listen to, to their ideas mm. and to include this into some sort of political dialogue. And yet that's very hard for the international community to do very because hard. it's um, it's frightened of the various actors for political reasons or because they're extreme. I mean, it'd be hard to have ISIS at the table, but often oh. it's um, often it's 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 for other very interesting reasons. I mean, if, if you're if you're with a faction that backs the Muslim, I mean, you know, if, if Britain were leading the, and historically Britain in, 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 in this conflict has been backing the Muslim Brotherhood. And, you know, you get, so you get different factions backing different factions. Mm -hmm. uh, and that influences who you talk to. Um, but it does, but yeah, you're right. It matters, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. If negotiations take place, then at least things progress and at least something is moving. And then hopefully you can sort things out at the end. Mm. Um, do you, um, the international community, what's your feeling? I mean, you're German. What, what's your feeling about the European role in this? Mm. Not much. I mean, <laughs> Not much. No. I guess it's at all. <laughs> um, I, so I find it very difficult in general to judge international intervention in this. I think it's really hard. You can't say, I, I remember in 2013 there was this huge, um, idea of the United States going into Damascus and everyone prepared for it and then to withdraw and say oh no we're not coming never mind we're not going to do this intervention issues like this cause a lot of tension um, and I think if you say you are going yeah, to do was, something you have to do something oh, or you that was so unwise I mean you can you imagine yeah it was very uh, unwise yes. but but the problem is I I believe you just have to um try and play with open cards and do what you claim to be doing and mm, mm. I know but it's very it's so difficult and this complex uh, or this this conflict especially it's very um, important to understand that things are a lot more complex that we might try and make them I have if, heard a lot yeah. of Syrians say to me that um, I mean a lot I think in one in particular but there, there are a number of them that mm. express similar view um, that if the international community all went home and left Syria alone, mm. um, then, I mean, you know, just turned their backs on Syria, just completely forgot Syria, yeah. then things would sort themselves out and mm. we wouldn't have had so much bloodshed and things would calm down. Mm. In other words, that the international community are much of the problem in, mm. in, in Syria. That's why Syria is... is or has not been for a long time a civil war anymore because there's so much international um, international meddling within this that it has just basically become a battlefield of many grievances that happen on a much larger scale. So it's very it's now very difficult because it has gotten to the stage and we're in the fifth year of the war now. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard now to say um, let them sort it out because this um, this conflict now is already an international conflict more than a civil war. Right, it's not a civil war anymore. You yeah. Say. Well, it is, it is and it isn't. It is and it isn't, exactly. Yeah. But this is um, why I think it's very hard to now come up with a good policy on whether, what the West should do. Should it go in and help more, and not only the West, but other countries? Should they do more or should they not do more? And yeah, it's impacted, of course, by ISIS. Mm. All, everything we do now is affected by ISIS, and we're uh, militarily, certainly cooperating with Bashar al-Assad in the fight against ISIS. We notice, mm. um, we notice in certain uh, bombing raids that uh, the the Syrian armed forces will go in, and then the coalition forces will go in. And to say, I, I know that Bashar al-Assad said there was no coordination. There has to be coordination. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. uh, so the um, so we we're in a situation now where um, the whole game has been changed by by the emergence of ISIS. Yeah, now they are the new baddie. They're the new enemy now. So mm. the spotlight has completely shifted yeah. from Bashir. At first, it was all about Bashir and fighting Bashir, who will replace him. And that was, that's not old news. Now yeah. it's all about ISIS. And they have the threat of ISIS has completely overwhelmed everything else. That is the biggest fear is ISIS completely taking over and establishing the caliphate and this uh, Islamic State, this idea that they have. Because um, they had this map, mm. this very overly ambitious map they released last year, where the the ICE, uh, Islamic State covered anywhere from North Africa up onto the subcontinent. Really, mm. to the Indian subcontinent. The that Indian was the uh, Islamic State map. Yeah, they, their the own map, map they created for themselves, right? As I said, overly ambitious. Yeah. But it's terrifying. It's really yeah. so. Now they're the new enemy. Everyone's and yet, so and yet, we have seen that. groups in Pakistan. Uh, Taliban groups in Pakistan claiming allegiance to ISIS. They've even done in India. They've come out and yeah. uh, said we support ISIS. I mean, the, mm. it's, it's Extraordinary. scary. Let's talk a bit about, we were going to talk, uh, and we should talk, uh, and we can come back to other things, but I know time is limited. Let's talk a little bit about the issue of international volunteers coming into ISIS. Mm. Um, the... Um, um, Again, figures are, are impossible. Uh, impossible, really. I, I, I met an aid worker from Brisbane, Australia, who works with the Muslim community in Brisbane, Australia, who assured me that 50, to her knowledge, 50 members of the Muslim community in Brisbane, Australia, had gone to Syria. I mean, most extraordinary. Uh, and and you, you, you have... People going from Britain, you have um, and this interesting dynamic about some people are saying that about 10% of the volunteers going from Britain to join ISIS are women. Um, uh, it, extraordinary in a way. And, and off, many of the people going from countries like Britain um, are quite well educated people. I mean, really, um, the ISIS is recruiting doctors and uh, people of high-skilled people. Um, extraordinary. All going down through Turkey, of course, yes, to, to of course. join. It's a gateway now, yeah. Turkey. I mean, uh, what have you... Uh, what, what, uh, tell us what your impression of this whole situation is, the international. Uh, first of all, um, just let's look at the figures. I mean, the fig um, research claims is anything about anywhere between fifteen to 20,000 foreign fighters fighting mm -hmm in ISIS, and about a quarter of that, so about 5,000, are fighters from the West. Mm -hmm. So they have a passport from Europe or North America. And it's, it's a shocking figure. And also very high numbers uh, from Australia, like you said, 50 from Brisbane. And Brisbane is not a big city. Mm. It's not mm. a very big city at mm. all. So that's a shockingly high figure. Numbers from Britain has been on the rise, uh, very worrying especially mm. lots of uh, young people, lots of women going over to be jihadi brides. Mm. And it really it makes you wonder what would yes. make you want to leave the comfort of your home and your family to go over to some foreign land and fight and mm. risk your lives. I mean, a lot of, um, of these young people have actually tried to come home because they've gotten there and realized is this is not what they imagined. Mm. This is not what I signed up for because they don't realize the brutality of it, the violence of it until they actually get there and they go... Oh, okay, I changed, my, I changed my mind. I want to come home now. And what Britain has to do is actually not bar them from entering because that's just going to make a problem even worse. I think they have to let them back in and sort of think of rehab in a way, address societal grievances. What Look at what actually made them leave in the first place. Because we are much uh, tougher, aren't we, than yeah. the rest of Europe in terms of, I mean, people come back, they're likely to be prosecuted or... Uh, yes. Um, mm. And it's uh, and they need to leave that little doorway open for them to come back and then sort of work together and, and try and like reintegrate them back into society. And mm. there is another dynamic here. I mean, Eva, you're European, but there there is there is a very strange disconnect in terms of of where people are going to ISIS from Europe. Um, 
you would expect France, with all of its social problems with, uh, and its integrationist policy, which has not quite worked, and mm. all of its slum conditions for Muslims, and all of the pressures. We've seen terrorism uh, go on in, in the, um, the whole Charlie Hebdo issue and so on. Um, in response to that, uh, and yet, in terms of, if you look at the, the Muslim population of France, mm. the per capita numbers going from a country like France, comparatively low, uh, mm. which is odd in a way, and yet um, very high in relation to the Muslim population of Britain, there, there are large numbers. Scandinavia, mm. there seem to be significant numbers. I mean, the there are even there are even a few from Spain going. I don't know. Don't understand what drives people. Some people say it's a search for purity. Mm -hmm. uh, some some people that say it's it's a disconnection with their own society. They don't feel they belong. But mm -hmm. um, what's your impression about this whole mm -hmm. business? I mean, I've I've looked at it more from a UK perspective yeah. because when you when you read the papers here, and I guess there are about six hundred from the UK now, if I'm not mistaken, and I think um, it's really interesting because what you've just said mm. now doesn't really reflect what the what the remedy is mm. that the government takes for this, and I think there's a lot of reporting on. Um, on the belief that the reasons for people actually joining ISIS lies within ISIS itself because it's an adventure and people strive to to do something and make their life more exciting and then you have the internet that plays a huge role in this um, that attracts people to go mm -hmm. so I believe there's there's one really um, important point that I would like to make because I think there's a lot of attraction to the argument that the Middle East itself or ISIS itself creates this pull factor that pulls mm. people to go and it's now this has become a very mobilized identity where it's very easy to find refuge if you're lost in your own life for a lot of young young people in Britain. But I also believe that it's really important that especially in our policies and in governmental policies towards this issue we realize that um, that in the West itself, there's a we create policies that lead to societal grievances for people, and that leads to or tends to be a push factor now for them yes. to go. Yes. And I think it's it's yeah. really important that surveillance. If we if we use surveillance, this can only solve half the problem because it's not about trying to understand everyone and who's gonna who's going to go and who's not going to go, but to actually address the, the deeper, um, deeper origins of this problem, that, yeah. people, that people are willing to um, actually go and commit violence to such an the extent. The sense of basically not belonging yeah, exactly. that, that causes this, and, and this disaffection, hmm. um, which is a tragedy. Yeah. Uh, and it is perhaps, um, I, I don't know, but up to a point, um, the, would it be true that countries with more multicultural policies as opposed to the integrationist ones? I wonder whether that... Mm. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but I wonder whether that's a factor. Integrationist countries like France, with all their problems, um, the United States, France, uh, are not getting swathes mm. of volunteers. Whereas multicultural countries, Canada, Australia, Britain, which have that mm. approach, people they're not, they're, people are likely to be more disaffected. Mm. Can I just uh, add one tiny thing to this? Yeah. I think it's really, um, really interesting then if you have the integrational approach, you always open um, the door for conflict and there's a lot more ongoing tension, but things are being talked about. Mm. So even grievances um, or problems can be raised to a different extent because people are thinking about it. Whereas if you have a multicultural approach, it's very easy to, to silence these voices because it's so easy almost to, to live in a multicultural society that there's very little understanding of that these could be problems. How Whereas, interesting. What an interesting yeah. thought that is. And, and, and Sri, the, the part of the problem too has to be the neighboring nations. I mean, we do um, Turkey, all these volunteers go through Turkey. I mean, I don't want to be anti-Turkish, but 
but it is it is a fact they have to go they have to travel they have to go um so this has to be a key issue no as i mean turkey i mean no one's actually openly questioning turkey about this mm -hmm. that's what i find it's sort of like everyone knows about this everyone knows turkey is the gateway i mean turkey is the only one that even flies out to countries that you usually can't fly to like libya or to our iraq or anywhere else and yes turkey with its borders with syria is the way to get in everyone knows it but no one seems to be saying much and i don't mm. know why i, I don't know mm. because they're afraid of offending turkey or the turkey is a mm. member of nato and i suppose yeah. this is so an i'm not issue. sure what is stopping yeah. them but everyone's aware of mm. this but very little is being done and i think mm. the, there needs to be pressure on the turkish government yeah, to because, do something about this. Because if our whole anti-ISIS campaign is confined to bombing, then the civilian, I mean, it's just not... There's no point, because uh, we've already seen through Kobani and through different mm. towns that the bombing is not liberating, it's just annihilating towns. Well, now, we've talked about this, we, we have... Uh, I wonder whether we can find a really positive note to end on. It's hard to, <laughs> isn't it? But, it is. um, but what we do want is more energy for for negotiation for peace and for, for a settlement. And God grant that that be the case. We don't need this to go on for another year. Um, and the alternative is, of course, the, the fragmentation of Syria into, into multiple mini nations. I mean, it's sad, but we've seen it in the Balkans. It's, it's maybe what will inevitably happen. I mean, yeah, I've heard about it. I mean, they said the same thing about Iraq. Mm. Um, but then again, uh, as usual, the West is trying to impose its idea of government, governance and democracy on a state that is completely different. I yeah. mean, we've done that in the past and we've seen it hasn't worked. Mm. We need to come up with a different type of uh, governance, a system that mm. will work for them within their society, within their culture, because our ideas and um, by imposing on it on them, has led to just more fights and conflicts. Mm. So obviously, I don't know. I mean, it's really hard to say. It's really hard to say. Uh, and no one knows for sure. Okay, well, that's... Very, Ava, have you got a positive note to give us for an end to this? Uh, we're not finished. We're going to go on to something else. But let uh, any, uh, for this section of our discussion, is there... A positive note to finish. Yeah, I think it's really important what you've said before. Open the doors for political dialogue. And if, um, if we let the people there, especially, decide up on their future more and let them try and figure out mm -hmm. how they um, want to come up with a solution to this, I think it's... It's better. It's better. And um, yeah, I do want to be hopeful that things are moving at some point in a positive direc direction. And, well, Eva, thank you. And Sri, thank you very much. We thank are you, going to end this part of the discussion, but not quite end our interview. But thank you. Thank you both very much. So, welcome back. Now, here we are. We have the final little moment of our program, and you each have picked up uh, two books, one each. Um, who are we going to start? We're going to start with Sri. We'll start with Sri. Yeah. You, you've, you've brought a book um, to share with us. Now, what yes. it, tell, tell me what it is. It's basically the autobiography of Azam Hedari. Mm -hmm. This uh, Iranian woman who came from a very strict Orthodox Islamic family. Her father was a mullah. And she was escaped marriage to a mullah at the age of 13. Uh, fought against a family to be educated, got her baccalaureate, and at the age of 20, joined the People's Mujahideen Movement mm -hmm, in Iran, mm -hmm. and basically was arrested. In, Iran, in Iran. 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 I see. Yes, go on. Yeah, this yeah. life of an Iranian woman uh, mm -hmm. in Iran, and she joined the People's Mujahideen Movement, and uh, after the Shah, the Shah of Iran was overthrown, and... Khomeini came to power, she was arrested by the Revolutionary Guards and imprisoned in the infamous, infamous um, Evan prison. But she was actually tortured by her own family members. Her, uh, How her bizarre. Brother, her cousin. She was actually tortured by them. And she eventually, she managed to she escape. She spent five years in this prison. 
she finally managed to escape to Iraq, where she still is. She's still in Iraq. And she lived on to write this really amazing book, really touching, really sad. To, you know, she was turned on by her own family. Her own family turned the against The Price her. of Being Human, it's yes, called. Um, and her, her name is Azam Haidari. 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 And she's, and this is, this is published here in the West, available presumably in, um, in the West. And, um, yeah, so interesting, interesting. And um, published by Homa. Um, excellent. Well, that's, that, that is going to be a fascinating read. It's very fascinating, it's touching. It, and she's still part of the People's Mujahideen Movement. And she spent years trying to advocate in, to the UN. And she finally, in 2009, got them off the terrorist list. Uh-huh. Okay. So, yeah, so a very impressive woman. For the last over 30 years, she's been fighting in this uh, movement. She strongly believed in it, despite being ostracized by family, being thrown in prison. Wow. And she eventually fled the country, and she still carried on her fight. She still had such strong beliefs in this movement. Interesting. Yes, it's very interesting. interesting. It just came across it recently, but it's, it's a good book. I definitely recommend right. it. It's quite sad as well. It's quite touching. Oh, we, we, we like happy endings. As long as you've got a happy ending, we'll be happy. Oh, Eva, what have you brought to us? This. I brought this. It's uh -huh. called I Saw Ramala from uh -huh. Red Ah, Now, this is resonant of your time in Palestine now, this book. Yes. Right, so, and, uh, and we should uh, explain to the ANN uh, listeners that you have worked in, in, or you were in, based in, in Ramallah yourself for some time. Yeah, for some time. And I, this was one of the first books I read before um, starting to really... Uh, work on the Middle East and um, do academic research on the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And it was very um, important for me and very, yeah, a very good um, introduction. And what I especially like about it, it's a bit of a, um, so it's the description when um, the author himself returned to Ramallah after being expelled for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And he talks about, in a very poetic way, about um, how the occupation changed life of the cities and life in the cities. But I, what I find really important about this, it shows um, a lot that lies outside of the conflict. So it right. gives you um, a bit of a counter narrative to all this talk about conflict in the Middle East, etc. And I like to so see the Middle East. this is a novel? Or? Yes, it's a novel. I saw a mother by Murid Barghouti. Yes. And uh, what is it? A, it's a thriller, a love story. What? What is? It? It's just his story of coming back to um, Ramallah. But as after, a novel, not, yeah, as, as, not a novel. as a fictional account. Yeah, but he talks a lot about places within Ramallah mm. and within the West Bank, which was great because I, when I travelled, I could really trace his um, mm. trace his walk back to it. And there are some beautiful lines. I just flipped through it and I had some, I marked some passages which I really liked, and maybe I can just read. One which I quite like because yes, it um, raises a lot of questions, or he's he, and he raises a lot of questions throughout the book. Mm, he says, "They make you wait. Am I hungry for my own borders? I hate borders, boundaries, limits, the boundaries of the body, of writing, of behavior, of states. Do I really want boundaries for Palestine? Will they necessarily a better solution and better boundaries?" Wonderful. Yes. That is wonderful. Like uh, yes, no, yes, a world without boundary, boundaries is what we all need, I think. Oh, I, I remember, I'm very fond of uh, Khalil Gilbran's thought mm. that we should live in a world without borders. Although, um, a world without borders, but a world without refugees would be the best, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Well, how point it, thank you. Um, so this is Azim, Azam Hadari, The Price of Being Human. And Murid Barghouti, I saw Ramallah. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you for being our guests on, on ANN Television. Really has been good to have you both with us. Well, thank you for having us. Thank yep. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Well, it's the first time we've had an interview with two people, so it's a real, it's a real positive first. Thank you both. Thank you.